So uh, thanks everyone, and uh, thank you for the uh, invitation. I'm uh, excited to uh, to be here, and I, I think uh, it's uh, it's always a pleasure to talk about um, you know our our successes and the opportunity uh, that we have to to make such a difference uh, in our uh, our community. So. Uh, my disclosure is I'm a, a consultant and speaker and uh, on the advisory board for Abumed, and I'm a, a cons uh, consultant uh, for uh, Corindus. So the first uh, stent uh, for the Wellstar Health System uh, was implanted by our, our very own uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Mangle in uh, December 2004 at uh, Kennestone Hospital. Uh, and since then, you know, there have been in probably an underestimate of over 20,000 cardiac interventions uh, just based uh, solely at Kennestone, I surmise across the system of Wellstar. And again, when I talk about the Wellstar cath lab, uh, I think it's important I would be remiss not to mention the tremendous work that's done at all of our PCI uh, hospitals. Uh, in addition to that, we have been uh, part of uh, dozens of clinical trials. And, you know, initially and in the past and in the, even the recent past, clinical trials have been mostly the purview of academic institutions with, with large research bases. Uh, in our case, uh, as, a, as a community hospital, uh, we are now in the forefront and, and very um, involved in a lot of clinical re research studies. Uh, there's been dozens of publications coming out of the cath lab uh, on, on a variety of subjects, including cardiogenic shock, high-risk intervention, uh, it's a lot of our structural, not to mention EP in this, and we've been very involved in, in, in being a forefront in, in clinical studies. Uh, we have a dynamic engaged group of uh, 19 interventional cardiologists across the system. So in 2012, uh, we started using a device called the Impella, and, and this was a game changer for us. And what the Impella is, it's a percutaneous left ventricle assist device uh, that takes blood from the left ventricle and expels it in, into the aorta. And while you know we've been using this since 2012, we really have found tremendous outcomes. And our, and our first uh, intervention was done in, in 2012 by Dr. Reitman and Shake. And you know this was a patient who uh, had terrible coronary artery disease. He was evaluated by cardiothoracic surgery uh, because of comorbidities and because of lack of conduits, he was deemed a surgical candidate. Now, in the past, uh, this patient, uh, would have basically treated medically, had a poor outcome and a poor trajectory, or have gone to hospice. Uh, this device has really allowed us uh, to treat these patients that were once deemed as no hope patients or no option patients, uh, and has really made remarkable uh, recovery in these patients. And we, we have reported over a 90% success rate uh, in treating these patients. Some of these patients that were treated were once uh, viewed as only transplant candidates. We have had patients who have come off the transplant list, who have come off advanced heart failure list uh, and have had tremendous outcome. We've done probably over 300 of these cases over the years. Uh, in addition to that, the Impel is used for our, our cardiogenic shock and uh, we are perhaps the largest cardiogenic shock and high-risk PCI program in the state of Georgia. Uh, and it has a testament of that we are nationally and perhaps internationally recognized shock center, which I'll elaborate on in a little bit. Um, Go back one. Uh, but also, again, the, we have been the keystone or the foundation of several clinical studies and registries and high enrollers in a lot of these studies, and you know have really set the standard a lot for a lot of other institutions and in how they treat cardiogenic shock. Now, you know, while the device in and of itself is a necessary ingredient in treating cardiogenic shock, uh, the device is insufficient, okay, in, in affecting outcomes. And you know, we came across with this. Um, algorithm and you know, the reason for this is you know the outcomes uh, were not as good as we as initially liked and you know the cath lab was initially treated and acted as if in silos as, as, as an ivory tower where we treated patients and then shipped them off but you know what we have learned through the years is that the cath lab must work in collaboration with other uh, specialties and, you know and, and again the, the treatment of the cath lab the treatment of these patients transcends the cath lab it, it's far beyond the boundaries and you can see here that when treating patients it's important that we collaborate and one of the things that we have seen and one of the things that we're really proud of uh, here at Wellstar is how we collaborate our patients how we collaborate uh, with other subspecialties to make sure we uh, improve our outcomes and while we all think that the you know an algorithm is is useful uh, this comes out of Stanley McChrystal's uh, 
book, uh, General Stanley McChrystal uh, and his experience of the uh, in Iraq with uh, fighting Al Qaeda. In, in that, you know, again, we all think of a hierarchical treatment of cases, and we all plan, but it's not really, uh, you know, what we what we always plan. In fact, most time it's not. And you know, a lot of times there are many audibles, and you know, we sit we consider you know treatment of cardiogenic shock not just as uh, a cookbook, but more as a playbook. And, you know, we have our own team of teams. Uh, sorry about that. And uh, this is our CCU team. And, and this is, again, where we collaborate care. Uh, we have seamless transition over our high-risk PCI, our shock PCI programs, our MIs, uh, and our, our CCU that's run here. We have uh, Rogers, our director, was a phenomenal um, leader and you know we have APPs, we have critical care medicine. So again, it's about treating these patients as a team, not just in, in, the, in isolation. Um, our cardiogenic shock network, uh, our integrated cardiogenic shock network, our spoken hub cardiogenic shock network was, was the first in the US uh, that we're aware of and that have been told is uh, and perhaps the first in the world where basically we had a very integrated system uh, with this. And the reason we put this together is for the treatment of our patients, okay, not just in, in, in the Keniston area, but throughout the state of Georgia. So the treatment at Douglasville Hospital, 100 bed hospital for cardiogenic shock at two in the morning on Saturday is the same as a treatment of cardiogenic shock at two in the afternoon on Tuesday, at Kennestone Regional Medical Center. So we, we have a lot of transfers. So basically patients get treated in the periphery and get uh, transferred in. Uh, we have a very uh, elaborate uh, relationship with, with our EMS providers. And this has really changed our outcomes and basically changed the paradigm of how we treat patients, not just in cardiogenic shock, but also in other subspecialties. Uh, as a testament of this, uh, the historical mortality of cardiogenic shock is 50%, and that goes back to data from 1999, and this has not changed for many years. But with the implementation of our program, okay, uh, not just the Impella, but also the algorithm that's implementing the team of teams, uh, we have improved our survival by uh, absolutely 20% and by 40% relative survival. And this is also noted as we take on sicker and sicker patients and not turning down patients who were once deemed uh, non-viable. So while you know, we are, the devices can sometimes change the, uh, our game changers, we are changing the games ourselves. Uh, and you know, now what we're doing for some of our patients, uh, and again, looking at novel ways to, to, to take care of, 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 our, of our advanced and our sickest patients. Uh, this is a, a gentleman uh, who was a pre, uh, was being evaluated by, for advanced heart failure therapy uh, for either transplant or a destination left ventricular assist device. Uh, he had a, a balloon pump in his leg and the balloon pump uh, you know, has been there, was there for quite some time. He was laying in bed, he was deconditioned and you know, we were approached and we got together and we say, you know what, if, if this patient remains deconditioned, he may not be a candidate for advanced therapies. Uh, and again, the device was placed percutaneously with an axillary, uh, through an axillary artery with uh, simple uh, access. Uh, and again, this was uh, traditionally done in the past with a cut down, it was a big procedure. And what this allowed is, uh, this patient to ambulate. Okay, so here we are in the CCU uh, and this gentleman who has a balloon pump who had been bedridden for weeks is now ambulating, he is recovering, he, he maintained strength and went on uh, to successful implementation of the left ventricular assist device. Uh, to make things even more on, on, a, on a higher level, uh, this is a gentleman who came in, uh, again, in cardiogenic shock, uh, had a very, very difficult course, uh, was being evaluated for, uh, for transplantation or destination LVAD. Uh, the surgeons uh, collaborated and he would get placed at a axillary impella through a surgical cut down. And again, this was once thought, uh, you know, un unthinkable, okay, that you could have a device such a 14 French, in this case, a 22 French device in the axillary or subclavian artery and have these patients walk around. And uh, this patient went on to do well and here he is visiting us uh, and our team, uh, our team far, you know, exceeds the number of people that are in this picture and most of the credit uh, goes to them. And again, this was recognized uh, in Atlanta Magazine as, as a, as a big win for us. Um, structural heart, oh, Dr. Patel is on the line. He's gonna talk more about some of the structural heart. Uh, our structural heart program was started in 2012. And uh, to date, uh, I believe there's been 
close to 800 impl uh, implantations. Uh, the MitroClip program was started in 2015, and our, our Watchman uh, program was started in 2017. Now, ECMO was introduced in 2017 as well, uh, and this has really changed, um, you know, how we treat patients. And again, it sort of been a necessary addition to our Spoken Hub model. Uh, and this is one of our cases here. Uh, this is a 26-year-old uh, gentleman who was in Paulding Hospital, uh, had a viral cardiomyopathy arrested at home, uh, had bystander CPR by his uh, his uh, girlfriend here, who subsequently became his fiance after we told him he couldn't do better than her. Uh, and basically, he presented in cardiogenic shock at uh, uh, Paulding Hospital, uh, was transferred to Kennestone for escalation, and almost on cue, he arrested on arrival at the Kennestone. Uh, he was emergently placed on VA ECMO, had a full recovery. Uh, and again, this also shows the collaboration we have with our EMS providers uh, who are vital to treating, the, treating our patients. So we, so we started entering new eras uh, and new treatments uh, that, that sort of um, evolved. And you know, now we're looking to launch a pulmonary embolism response team. While we've been doing some procedures, uh, we really have, we have not really developed a program for this. And this program is set to launch uh, in April. And you would ask, why would interventional cardiologists, or why would the cath lab be treating pulmonary embolisms? Well, the reason being the cath lab is a very efficient, lean operation that, that is very well response at the time. We're, we're very much aware of, of, the, of the criticalness of time and that is really based on our door to balloon time. So uh, two things we're, we're starting to use more frequently and we've formalized a program is our pulmonary, is our, this is our ECOS catheter. Uh, basically it's a catheter that's implanted into the pulmonary arteries uh, and uh, through ultrasonic waves and through uh, low level thrombolytic therapy intravenous uh, it improves thrombus, and this is the Inari catheter, which is a pulmonary thrombectomy, uh, which involves removal of a thrombus. Uh, and again, this, this is, and the beauty of the cath lab in, in, in this day and age is that we collaborate. And again, the, the PERT program is not a cath lab project. It's not a uh, pulmonary project. It is a Wellstar project. We talk about multiple teams in collaboration. And again, similar to our shock program, okay, we now have a spoken hub model uh, treatment. Again, we want to treat our patients at every hospital the same as we treat at Kennestone. Um, so, you know, all these hospitals are going to have access to pulmonary embolism response team. Uh, we're going to have an integrated seamless uh, system. So what is the future lie? Uh, I mean, there are many things, but the one thing we are really engaged in is our robotic treatment. Uh, initially, robotics were felt to be mostly to help the operator for occupational injury to, to minimize radiation, uh, to minimize uh, musculoskeletal injuries. Uh, interventional cardiologists uh, achieve, receive more radiation than people that work in a nuclear power plant, if you put that in perspective. Uh, but this has sort of evolved into looking not just as, you know, using this for, for the physician, but also because of submillimeter operation. But the, the future, where this future lies or potentially lies is in remote PCI. And uh, this has been proven. And this is a, a, a fascinating case in India. And this is Dr. Tejas Patel uh, over in India. And he is in a temple, okay? He is in a temple in India. And hundred kilometers away, okay, he is manipulating and doing a procedure on a patient in the cath lab in Jaipur. So uh, again, this has really let us say, like, how do we reach our patients? If you look at how cath labs are set up across the USA, there is a tremendous variance in volume where there are cath labs that are doing single digit interventions per year, mostly for STEMI, and there are places that have not had uh, significant outreach. Uh, so this may be a, a tremendous game changer, in you will, uh, for treatment of remote PCI. Now, they have done studies in the U.S. of 100 miles of, of, by Ryan Mader in Grand Rapids, Michigan, doing an intervention on an animal. Uh, and there's actually now with Siemens 5G, uh, they have done uh, models in a model, a transcontinental uh, intervention from a uh, from station at, in, in New York City to San Francisco, and uh, it's really exciting uh, the potential uh, that this is, has. And again, where this has really had potential is this may lay, and robotics may be 
uh, the future for neurointerventional radiology, given the, uh, the tremendous uh, necessity to treat those patients. And again, if, if you look at cardiology and intervention, the CAF habit has really let the, set the framework uh, for remote interventions in multiple subspecialties. So the CAF lab, we are perpetually evolving. We're a very engaged group. Uh, we're always looking to do better for our patients. Uh, it is a nationally recognized system. I mean, we are, have been recognized in, the, in, you know, in, in, in programs and in, in, on national stages, uh, the same as you know, hospitals that have had such you know, reputable um, you know, programs. Uh, and I, I think our program is just superb. And again, we, we're really looking, and the reason we do this is to make sure the patients in our community get cutting edge care therapy and to prove their outcomes for all of our patients. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sal, that was great. Um, let's see here, can we come back up uh, to see who is our next presenter? I believe it's me. Okay. Max. Jeffrey. You ready to move on? You are up next, go right ahead. All right, can you all see my slides? Yep. Yes. Yes. Perfect. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm Jeff Sachs, one of the pediatric cardiologists at Wellstar. And I'm going to speak with you about cardiac sports evaluation. Now, I do want to preface that, unfortunately, I think this talk may lead to more questions than answers. But hopefully, by presenting some data or reviewing what's known, you'll be able to make some more informed decisions in caring for your patients. So the objectives of this talk are to understand the importance of myocarditis in sports evaluation, and then to learn what data about COVID-related cardiac complications can exist for athletes. And finally, to review several proposed algorithms for making determination for sports participation. The goal being to have you feel more comfortable managing sports clearance in the COVID era. Now, many of us have seen images like this on TV, the dreaded scene of an elite athlete at peak physical fitness collapsing on a quarter field. And this Florida basketball player collapsed during a game shortly after returning to the team after being diagnosed with COVID. And as you may have seen, it was covered by ESPN, local and national news. And these scenes create panic and fear for athletes, parents, coaches, and certainly providers. Now contrast this with Demi Washington, a Vanderbilt basketball player who had COVID and because of a protocol put in place by Vanderbilt was found to have evidence of myocarditis. It was notable that the MRI she obtained was not required by either the SEC or the NCAA, but because of Vanderbilt's protocol, her case of myocarditis was identified. So was her life saved as a result of this? Now that we'll, we'll never know, but the sentiment is certainly implied and it certainly begs the question. So Ms. Washington made a statement after this, after this was found, and she said, I might be out on the court right now if I was not at Vanderbilt. It's so important that every person associated with student athletes be aware of the benefits of doing a cardiac MRI. And as athletes, we need to know more and advocate for ourselves. We always think these th kinds of things won't happen to you, but when it does, you want all of those extra steps taken. It's always better to be safe than having to say, I'm sorry. Now this brings us to a very important balancing act, one of increasing importance, the balance of cost and public health. Now cardiac testing in sports is a hotly debated topic and one that we will certainly not answer today. But as we move forward with this talk, I want you to keep in mind that universal screening with EKGs, for example, in athletes in the United States is not even currently recommended because the cost benefit ratio has not been proven effective. Now contrast that with cardiac MRI, which are much more limited in availability, much more expensive and time consuming, have increased risk if there's contrast involved and have far fewer people capable of reading and interpreting them. So with all of this, we're faced with a very difficult situation. Now let's take a moment to get a background on sports evaluation recommendations here in the US. So as I mentioned, neither EKG nor ECHO are routinely recommended for sports clearance in the United States. 
Typically, all that is done is a history and physical exam, and then further assessment only if there's concerns that arise. Now, this is partially because the AAP, or American Academy of Pediatrics, um, estimates 35 to 45 million young people play sports, and the cost-benefit analysis of these tests and their respective false positives and negative rates makes testing all of these individuals challenging to say the least. So how many of you read an EKG or have seen an EKG interpretation that said nonspecific ST changes? This alone would lead to innumerable echocardiograms and cardiology consults, but for what benefit? The debate rages in the cardiology community with strong and valid arguments made on each side, but COVID has created unique challenges for sports clearance because of the concern of myocarditis. Thus, enhanced screening is being discussed. So why is myocarditis such a big deal? Well, before COVID, there were an estimated 1.5 million cases worldwide. And it was also estimated that myocardium uh, was at least somewhat involved in one to 5% of all viral infections. Furthermore, five to 22% of all sudden deaths can be attributed to myocarditis, most of which occurred during exercise. Now, finally, we have also noted that late gadolinium enhancement on MRI is a marker for myocarditis and has been independently associated with sudden death. So let's look at a little bit of data. So one study out of Ohio really rocked the world of cardiology and sports medicine in terms of COVID. They looked at 26 young, healthy athletes, all of whom had no or very mild symptoms of COVID. EKGs and echoes were performed on all of them and all were normal. Troponins as well, all negative. But then they did MRIs on each one as this is the gold standard assessment for myocarditis. And four of these individuals or 15% had evidence of active myocarditis, two of whom had pericardial effusions and eight or 26% had late gadolinium enhancement suggestive of previous myocardial injury. And as I just mentioned, this can be associated with sudden death in athletes. But what we don't know is what is the risk of sudden death in these athletes with COVID. Nonetheless, the author of the work states, when cardiac involvement is detected, return to exercise should be based on myocarditis specific guidelines. So let's assume these patients have real deal myocarditis. What do these guidelines recommend? Well, for starters, just making the diagnosis typically involves an EKG, echocardiogram, troponin, and cardiac MRI. And then if the diagnosis is made, athletes are restricted for three to six months, followed by repeat EKG, echocardiogram, MRI, stress test, and Holter monitoring, all of which are recommended. And because of a 10 to 15% recurrence risk, individuals should be reassessed periodically especially during the highest risk period of the first two years. This is no small workup. Now, once we are even at that three to six month mark, there is still shared decision-making that is needed to have athletes return to sports. This is because the risk is still not zero of an athlete having sudden death, not to mention the athlete's desires, education, and sometimes livelihood may very well depend on their participation in sports. However, if this shared discussion reveals a decision to participate, it only should be done if LV function, biomarkers such as troponin, ECG, Holter monitoring, stress testing are all normal. And those who had residual late gadolinium enhancement should still be followed on a yearly basis, even if asymptomatic. So how do we navigate this in the middle of a pandemic when literally millions of individuals have been infected and are potentially at risk? Can you imagine the cost and logistical nightmare this could create? Well, with such limited data, numerous algorithms have been developed, but unfortunately they often conflict with each other, making it difficult to know exactly what to do. For example, numerous studies seem to indicate that younger children are less affected than older children and adults. And one such recommendation published by the Journal of American College of Cardiology, Jack, used a cutoff of 15 years of age to consider an athlete an adult. But another article in the same publication chose 12 years of age. And then contrast that with the American Academy of Pediatrics who chose 10 years of age as their cut point. 
Then the valuation recommendations also differ substantially across organizations and have also been modified in a very short period of time. For example, the American Academy of Pediatrics initially recommended a history and physical and only doing an EKG if there are moderate or more severe symptoms and further testing based on that assessment. However, they revised this recommendation in December to state that moderate symptoms or more should have a cardiology consultation prior to return to sports. Now, unfortunately for me, they did not specify which type of workup is recommended during that cardiac consultation. But contrast that with Columbus Children's Hospital, who had a grand rounds commending, recommending universal cardiac MRI for all older children who exhibited any symptoms at all. Even within the pediatric realm, there's significant discrepancy. So let's take a look at a few of the algorithms that have been distributed to get a general idea of what is out there. Here's the algorithm from the American College of Cardiology, and I'll take a moment to go through this with you. As expected, if asymptomatic and COVID testing is negative, meaning no evidence of any COVID infection, no specific workup is needed. But many programs are doing regular COVID testing and mandatory screening. So for those individuals who test positive but are asymptomatic, either by screening or contact tracing, they recommend rest for two weeks with close monitoring of symptoms, followed by slow resumption of activity after the two week mark from the positive test. Now, if a positive test, but only mild symptoms, an EKG, echo, and high sensitivity troponin should be obtained. Now, we actually don't even have this troponin accessible here at Wellstar, though I understand it's in the works to get it um, available. And then if this testing is normal, slow resumption of activity is recommended. If any abnormal studies, the patient should be treated as if they have myocarditis using the workup we outlined before. Now, finally, if there are significant symptoms and or hospitalization, again, recommend troponin and consider further imaging. If normal testing, again, restrict for two weeks, slow return and consider further workup if needed. But if the troponin is elevated or an abnormal study, again, treat as myocarditis. Now, also from the American College of Cardiology is a pediatric cardiac specific algorithm with very different recommendations. And it showed for moderate symptoms in children less than 12, no further evaluation is needed. But if greater than 12, an EKG should be performed and further assessment based on this. Let's look a little closer. If asymptomatic, regardless of age, they are cleared for participation after their similar recommendation of two weeks of monitoring for symptoms. If moderate symptoms, but not hospitalization, defined as prolonged fever or requiring bed rest, they separate based on age. If less than 12 years of age, clear for participation. If greater than 12 years of age, they recommend EKG. But if normal, even with those moderate symptoms, clear. But if abnormal, evaluate by a pediatric cardiologist. The theory here is that less than 12 years are unlikely to have significant cardiac involvement. Now, finally, for severe cases or evidence of missed C, they recommend EKG, echo, Holter, stress test, and possible MRI with a restriction for three to six months as they are treating for presumed myocarditis. Now, interestingly, the NCAA has their own guidance, though this does kind of make sense since they're typically higher intensity athletes compared to middle and high school athletics, as well as the typical adult athlete. And while they're generally in the adult range, many college students are treated by pediatricians, but others are treated by adults. So let's take a look at this algorithm. If a confirmed past infection based on previous PCR test or antibodies, and if symptoms were managed at home, but have now resolved, you can consider an EKG and echocardiogram. But if it was a severe illness, even if it has passed, such as requiring hospitalization or ongoing symptoms, they recommend cardiac consult with EKG and echocardiogram and consider myocarditis workup with MRI, Holter, and stress, as well as a pulmonary evaluation, including X-ray, spirometry, PFTs, D-dimer, and chest CT. Now this is all for a previously confirmed past infection, but not an active one. 
Interestingly, if there's a new infection, the workup differs from a known previous infection. All individuals should consider an EKG and echo, as well as a troponin, whether asymptomatic or severe illness. Then the moderate plus patients should be rested for the 14 days as opposed to 10 days, and an MRI should be considered. Now there's one more algorithm I would like to share with you this morning, and this comes from multiple European sports medicine organizations, and they group level of illness into six categories, ranging from no symptoms at all or evidence of COVID to severe symptoms requiring ICU and artificial respiration. They have a nice tool that more specifically allows you to break down who is in what group and what evaluation may be needed essentially implying anyone with a positive test requires 14 days of quarantine and exclusion from sports. They similarly provide a tool to determine what evaluation is needed. And this is similar to the other algorithms where X is not indicated, square is maybe indicated, and check is definitely indicated. And here they review the cardiac testing required by each group but it also includes blood tests where they have added a CRP and BNP, which differs from the other evaluations, in addition to the stress test, echo, and MRI. And they also provide an additional tool from a pulmonary standpoint. And what I like about this is it's sort of a one-stop shop. You find what group you're in and you get a clear cardiac and pulmonary evaluation. Now, as time has gone on, um, these algorithms have started circulating and there have been some new data that has come out recently. So for example, a study out of Vanderbilt, which was larger than the original Ohio cohort, took 59 athletes, all with COVID, with 60 healthy controls. Now the Ohio study had no healthy controls, but all of these individuals had an MRI and two or 3% of them were found to have positive findings on their MRI consistent with potential myocarditis that differed from their controls. That said, most controls did actually have local late gadolinium enhancement, indicating that this may be a common finding in healthy athletes and not necessarily indicative of myocarditis at all. This is a warning about the false positives that can be seen using this modality. But they did find that mid-septal relaxation times and T2 signaling were unique to the COVID group, but alarmingly, all of these individuals who had uh, these findings had normal EKGs, echoes with strain imaging and negative troponins. So briefly, just to touch on strain imaging, which is an echo modality that has been utilized as a potential marker for more significant myocardial injury separate from MRI. This is a time consuming modality is not universally available and not all machines are even capable of performing it, let alone not all cardiologists are comfortable using it. But nonetheless, there have been some reports that strain can correlate with more significant illness. One study showed it could be used to predict relative morbidity as it indicated by hypoxia, lab values, and respiratory support required. And it also had a sensitivity of 94%, but only 65% specificity when using it to predict mortality. So while predicting mortality may be useful in an ICU setting, these other markers would largely be known already and strain imaging may not offer substantial new information for a now recovered healthy athlete. And furthermore, as I mentioned in the Vanderbilt study, it did not help predict MRI findings consistent with myocarditis. So with this in mind, we at Wellstar created our own algorithm specifically geared for the KSU athletes we take care of in line with the NCAA recommendations, as it seemed sort of middle of the road. We start with an EKG and echo, and if further concerns move to MRI, and if the MRI is positive, we restrict for about three to six months as consistent with myocarditis recommendations, hoping that any overt cardiac disease will be picked up with the initial evaluation. Now, once cleared by these protocols, the British Medical Journal did release a graduated return to play algorithm based on the number of days post-infection and percent exertion that should be utilized during each stage. This is about a two to three week process at minimum and continued monitoring is required with progressive increases in exertion as well as length of workouts over time. 
So to conclude with a few points, it is obviously quite difficult to navigate this with such a lack of data. Unfortunately, it's even harder with conflicting recommendations. That said, universal MRI is not feasible from a cost or logistical standpoint in many situations, including our own. So it's important to stay up to date and educated on what is out there and educate our patients that there's much unknown that while there may be no overt cardiac disease found during our evaluation, this does not exclude, but hopefully reduces the possibility of cardiac complications. But new information comes out day by day and time will tell what the true burden of this really is. So thank you very much for your time. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer or feel free to email me or call us at any time if you have any questions. So uh, Jeff, could you comment briefly on your uh, or our experience with some of the protocols? What, what sort of findings have you been noticing and, and um, uh, have we been seeing a lot of MRI abnormalities? What, what, what's been your experience thus far? That's a great question. So we have seen a lot of individuals post COVID, both NCAA athletes and just regular patients. We have sent a relatively small number for MRI based on persistent symptoms or EKG or echo findings. One individual had uh, slight changes on their MRI initially, but actually in the interim of their three to six month um, stay away from sports participation, some of this new data came out where we really felt that that individual probably did not have myocarditis after all, but it was really more about some of just the, the normal athletic changes that we're starting to see on MRI. Uh, that individual since had a stress test and was normal as well. Interestingly, her echocardiogram revealed an anomalous coronary artery, so that was another indication to, to do further testing. But that's really the only one that had anything and none have actually um, had any significant findings on MRI to date. Jeffrey, uh, this is a, a Sal, a, a fantastic talk and I appreciate it. So, um, you know, my, my son is actively involved in, in, in several sports and they have had, uh, you know, several uh, athletes uh, in the teenage group that have tested positive for COVID. And it seems like, you know, what they basically do is just say, you know, you're out for 10 days and come back, mostly for quarantine. Uh, my understanding is that there is very little, if any, knowledge uh, of this in the community. Is there a way we can get the message out? Because I, it, or do you think we need to get a broader message uh, to, the, to the younger athletic group? Yes, we, it's definitely something we've been working on. So I created a summary of the American Academy of Pediatric Recommendations, for example. Um, and then again, when they were updated in December and had them distributed to all the pediatricians at Wellstar. Um, I also work with the Marietta City Schools. So I've been in close communication with them um, as well as KSU athletes, but it's definitely an uphill battle. And it's also, you know, the pediatricians are sort of overwhelmed with every runny nose, does this kid need to be excluded from school already, that to then have everyone once they recover come back in for a repeat sports physical is just very, very challenging. So there's, there's a little bit of pushback too about how can they possibly do this. Um, but it's important because there is so much unknown and what we certainly don't want is something catastrophic happening to one of these athletes. So sure. getting that word out there is important. All right, if there are no other questions here, uh, let's go ahead and move on to our next speaker. And uh, let's see, uh, Amr, is that you or, yes? Yep. Go right ahead, go right ahead. Very good, can you all see my screen? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, for having me today. Um, I think some just some fantastic uh, topics uh, that we have for you. I, you know, as as part of the structural arm program uh, sort of offerings, I'm going to talk about one uh, one area in particular. But like Dr. Menina was alluding to, 